Mr. Chair, can we have a legal attorney client before next week's meeting uh, when we'll actually be addressing the PUD? Um, but let's see. We can have it after a 3.30 agenda. Is that when you'd like to have it? Yeah, I'd just like to have it before we get to this on the agenda. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Attorney? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. We are live on YouTube. All right, go ahead and take us live um, to the audience. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Tuesday, February the 2nd agenda session. Uh, now I'll call this meeting to order. Could I have a motion on the minutes, please? Motion no approved. Second. All right, with no objection from the council, the minutes will stand as recorded. Uh, this afternoon, we have um, no items under final reading. We do have a couple of items under first reading, under uh, public works and transportation. I think we covered those, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Councilman Mitchell, in um, our public yes, works did. last week. Yes, uh, we did. Unless there are questions concerning items A or C, we'll move on. All right, I'm seeing no hands. Uh, under resolution, Madam Clerk, 7C, please. A resolution authorizing the Chief Information Officer to renew blanket agreement with IT Pipes LLC for the purchase of sewer assessment inspection products and services for first optional one-year renewal term beginning January 1, 2021, and ending December 31st, 2021, with one optional annual renewal remaining for an amount not to exceed $60,000 for contract year. All right, any questions or comments? Very well. 7D, please. Uh, I guess we probably covered, uh, we covered that as well. Yes, sir. Uh, under uh, our public works. In fact, uh, next, uh, all the way through H was covered under public works and transportation last week. Unless you have questions or comments about any of those items, uh, we're gonna continue on. Any questions or comments? All right, they were all read into record last week. Uh, Council, if you would pull up your purchasing uh, items uh, for this afternoon and let me know if you have any questions regarding those. All right, uh, Councilman Ledford. Sorry, Chairman, I was, uh, if Tony just reach out to me uh, before six. I just had a couple questions about the investigations vehicle. Okay, let me look and see. He is on the call with us. Uh, Mr. Simmons, I'm just gonna ask if you would reach out to Councilman Ledford um, prior to our six o'clock meeting this afternoon and have a conversation with him, sir. Uh, well, work. thank you. That'll work? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I see no other hands uh, regarding our purchases uh, for this evening. If you would look at next week's agenda, February the 9th, let me know if there's anything on that agenda uh, that you would like to address this afternoon. Councilman Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I'm on the 9th. That's, uh, number, resolution 7A. Uh, this is about McCamey Animal Center and that Finance yeah. package, and are we? Uh, does everybody have the? Uh, whoa, 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 whoa! Oh, yeah, yeah. Next week. I'm sorry. Yeah, next ahead. week. That, that's where we are. Are we? Yeah, that's that's correct. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm trying to get down to it. Yeah, I see it now. I yeah. just know there there was a couple of questions, including some of mine. I just I just was like, is, is everybody ready to go on that, or do we need some more information from someone out there? Well, I will say uh, the language was amended uh, per uh, vice chair's suggestion. And I think it cleared up any concern that uh, vice chair had, it's my understanding. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you can certainly chime in. Yes, uh, if, that's correct, Chair. Yeah, so uh, unless you or some other council person, I guess may still have some lingering questions or concerns uh, I believe we're ready to go. Uh, is there anything you'd like to know 
uh, specifically, Councilman? No, I, I, I just hope we're ready to go and one, one way or the other. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Good deal. All right. Any other questions uh, concerning February the 9th agenda? All right. Um, our future considerations, if you would pull those up. Uh, it is my understanding that everything that you see listed here on future considerations will be on next week's two week agenda. So unless you have an item that you would like um, uh, to see held up or um, postponed, all the items here listed will be on next week's two week agenda. Mr. Chair, if it appears on a two week agenda and as, as it relates to public works and transportation items, we should have the ability to go over those in the committee meeting next week. Uh, very well, thank you, sir. Okay, I am not seeing any hands at this time. Uh, please let me know if you do have some concerns uh, concerning our future considerations. We have no department reports uh, this afternoon, and we do have uh, a couple of, of uh, committee meetings uh, uh, this afternoon, economic community development, youth and family development, and then planning and zoning. So, uh, and we will follow that schedule. Uh, so at this time, I will turn the floor over to Councilman Oglesby for economic and community development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I now call the community, economic and community development committee meeting to order. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All right, with no objections, we'll move on to the items for review. Uh, Madam Clerk. Please, let's start with Resolution 7A. A resolution authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into a first agreement to exercise option to renew and substantially the form attached with the Forgotten Child Fund, Inc. to lease approximately 1,142 square feet of office space located at 1715 East Main Street, identified as tax parcel number 156BD011, for two additional terms of one year each for the period through October 31st, 2021 for the amount of $1 per year. Seeing no hands, let's now move on to 7B. A resolution authorizing the administrator for the Department of Economic and Community Development to amend guideline, guidelines for the affordable housing fund to allow up to $500,000 to be utilized for rent, mortgage, and utility assistance for low to moderate income households impacted by COVID-19. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Now we will move on to items for next week's agenda, Tuesday, February the 9th. Let's go with resolution 7A. A resolution authorizing the mayor to execute a temporary waiver of reversion is substantially the form attached in favor of the security interest of First Horizon Bank, authorizing the city to temporarily waive for a period of 15 years the right of reversion on the McKamey Animal Center parcel located at 4500 North Access Road, identified as tax parcel number 119HA001.04. Excellent. Okay, seeing none. It's now. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you changed the color of your hand, <laughs> Vice Chairman <laughs> Smith. I never used to be able to raise my hand. This is all new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, just following up on a question that was uh, asked earlier, uh, Phil, on this item, I believe we discussed some language that I had proposed last week. Uh, it is not represented in. Uh, this portion of the language, I just want to make sure that the backup documentation, the copy I have isn't linked. So I wasn't able to click through just to verify, but just wanted to get your confirmation that that language was changed. So it's not specifically 15 years, but it's 15 years or uh, whenever the loan has been satisfied, if it is, if it is within 15 years, is that correct? Yes, sir. That language was changed. I was confirming with this Miss Malik who did that uh, to make sure our version is the same uh, for tonight. It will be. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. All right, Madam Clerk, let's read 7B, please. 
a resolution authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into a first agreement to exercise option to renew in substantially the form attached with Hunter Museum of American Art for an additional term of 10 years to lease seven locations as specifically identified in the lease agreement dated October 26, 2009 for the display of artwork for public benefit and enjoyment. Excellent. Uh, Councilman Bird, you good with that, sir? Sure. All right, excellent. All right, that concludes that part of uh, our agenda. Now we will move on to a pilot project presentation by CNE. So Madam Clerk, would you please bring uh, Donna? She's gonna give us a uh, opening and then Martina, who's gonna actually give us the presentation on this pilot project proposal. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Good afternoon, Council. I, I am unmuted. Thank you, um, Council. We have before you a presentation from Martina Guilfoyle, who is the President uh, and CEO of Chattanooga Neighborhood Enterprise. She will be presenting to you a project that they have submitted to ECD for consideration of pa payment in lieu of taxes uh, pilot program through the affordable housing pilot uh, program. And uh, our staff has vetted the application and this project is uh, eligible and meets all the eligibility criteria. Um, I will add that this uh, project, the May Bill 2, I've, as it sounds, is the second Maybell building, and uh, many of, of you will know that Maybell Hurley was a great civic servant as well as a former council member. So um, you will see the city's involvement in the first project, Maybell 1, that allowed for income restricted housing. And Ms. Guilfoyle will tell you more about the project for the Maybell 2, the details of Maybell 2. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Welcome, Martina. Glad to have you here. If you unmute yourself, we'll get the presentation started. Okay. Hi, everyone. I've never done this on uh, Zoom. It's an interesting format. <laughs> um, okay, I have a PowerPoint um, that we can focus on. Do you know how you're going to... I s am I supposed to share my screen or is, yes. are you going to share it from your end? You can share your screen, Martina. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't know that. So um, I thought y'all were going to. Uh... Uh, Martina, if you prefer, uh, I did send the presentation, the PDF presentation that you sent over to the council clerk. So whichever is easier for you. It's okay. I've got it up um, right here. So let me just go here and I will share my screen. Um Okay, so um, this is the Maybell 2. Many of you probably either attended our grand opening of the Maybell 1 on uh, Bailey Avenue. Um, it's been in operation now for, uh, believe it or not, four years. And we have a very low vacancy rate of, of about less than 2%. Um, this project is in District 9 and Council, the County Commission District 4, and it's directly uh, across the street from um, uh, Girls Leadership Account Academy and the new Montessori School that they're building. Um, okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so just an overview of the property. Uh, c &E is a 501c3 tax exempt organization, but we are not exempt from paying property taxes. So oftentimes people think because we're a nonprofit that we don't pay taxes, but this year we will actually pay $149,715. And we know this because I believe we just wrote checks this week to the city and the county for our tax bill. Uh, and that uh, returns $70,000 to the city. Um, from all of our different properties that we that we own, um, you may know that. And one of the things that CNE is really intentional about is creating mixed income communities. So all of our buildings that we operate have a mix of income restricted, 
using home funds and our project over on Fifth Street across from the Lindhurst Foundation. Those are actually LIHTC uh, income restricted units. And then CNE voluntarily restricts an additional 30% of all of our units to incomes less than 80% of AMI. Um, for 50% of all of our units, we, we target to be 80% or below AMI. And then 63 units, we don't care if they have in, if, what, the, what their incomes are. So that then really creates a nice balance of people uh, living in community of all sorts of different income mixes. Uh, we have 38 more units opening in 2021, including five income home restricted units on Bailey. If anyone has driven by those, uh, they're beautiful. Um, uh, you can go online. The, actually, the interiors are now up on our rental page. And I think it's one of the most beautiful projects we've done to date. Um, and then I think we have another uh, 60 or 70 um, units in development over the next couple of years. So our pilot request, we've never uh, done a pilot before, but this project qualifies. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's a, a new construction of 47 units in six buildings. As you noticed in the picture in the very uh, first slide, that we have the Maybell, which is a three-story building along Bailey Avenue, and then along Hawthorne facing the Girls uh, Leadership Academy is a three-story walk-up, 18 units in that building, and then meeting with the residents of the neighborhood, they, they were really interested in having uh, houses that mirrored the front porches of the houses that are on Union, and so we've created a new missing middle product, which are quadplexes, and they are meant to fit on a, a, a 40 by 150, basically, a residential urban lot. And so part of, of course, CNE's interest is getting small scale multifamily product in neighborhoods to help increase density um, and, <clears throat> again, mixed income communities. We're asking for a 10 year pilot uh, and we will uh, provide the city and county taxes at our pre-development level, which is currently $721 to the city. Uh, this land was previously owned by Tennessee Temple University. And so it was pretty much tax exempt for many years. So that's why the low tax base, uh, but we will continue to pay our water quality fees and this year the bill was $1,523 and it will go up as a result of this um, development. So we are generating revenue for the city. Uh, and then our count, we're asking the county, uh, we'll, we'll continue to pay the, their general fund taxes at pre-development level, and then we'll pay the school taxes, uh, which will increase as a result of this development. Um, <clears throat> The uh, one of the one of the uh, in talking with one of you last week, uh, the the um, comment was made that well these projects do cost the city uh, because of services and, and those sort of things. But it's important to think that the Maybell is really part of a bigger project of the Maybell one and two, and the Maybell is currently paying the city thirty six thousand four hundred and seventy seven dollars in property taxes. So I think that that does um, help in terms of when you think about um, the cost of providing services at that immediate location. Um, we're paying a substantial um, fee there. Um, just to break out for you what the Maybell rents look like, the pilot uh, restricted units are 26 of those that we're planning for this development. The rents uh, range between 695 and 850. The weighted average of all of rents then is in for the pilot is 759. Uh, the home restricted units that will be part of this project, we have nine um, home restricted units that I believe will come to the council, that agreement uh, after the pilot or together. I don't know how Donna is going to uh, work that, but those rents are anywhere from 617 to 751. And then our market rate units, we have 12 of those and those are 1250. So you can really see the difference in rent structure between market and, and pilot um, that we're striving for. And just, I don't know if people know this, but the average rent in the Chattanooga area right now is $1,035. So 
So when and the downtown rents are 1200, almost $1,300. So when you think about who lives in the Maybell and who's attracted to the Maybell and the kind of price differential, you can see how these pilot units really have an impact in terms of uh, our, our workforce that um, can live here and, and afford to live close to downtown. Um, so what's the return on investment? I think that's really, you know, getting to the bottom line. I think it's really important to think about the opportunity for our, our workforce to be able to live in a vibrant neighborhood like Highland Park um, and have the opportunity to live there in an area that is becoming increasingly expensive. And it provides a long-term affordable housing strategy that also then supports racially and economically diverse communities. And all of our buildings are, as I mentioned before, not only are they economically diverse, but they're racially diverse. And that's really important as we start looking at some of the makeup that's going on in our communities. Um, and then finally, I just thought it was interesting to kind of talk about what are some of the jobs that qualify for affordable housing? Because we put this word affordable housing and what does that mean? We don't, it's good to put a face on it. So I went out to various job sites and some of the jobs are a Goodwill truck driver, uh, a Publix work sanitation driver from Signal Mountain. It makes $15 an hour. Uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, fast food places, their trainees are 12 to $14 an hour. Uh, sales associates, you know, Aldi's is $13. And one of the challenges with, as we know, with sales, uh, they often only have part-time work. They don't give them full-time work. Uh, leasing agent, um, <clears throat> uh, that's $13 an hour. And then you can read the rest. So I know someone's, uh, when we talk about who, who benefits from affordable housing, and sometimes people don't want affordable housing in their neighborhoods, but then you think who's really benefiting, who are the people that c and &E and this pilot can serve, and it's really the people that make up the backbone of our community in terms of many of the services that we use. So um, with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Thank you, Martina. Uh, are there any- stop sharing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilman Mitchell, please, followed by Councilman Ledford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Martini, that was a great presentation. Um, you, you made the comment on the last slide about assuring racial diversity, and, and I'm wondering if you had any numbers to share with us on the Maybell 1 on uh, proving racial diversity in that project. Um, I should have that number. I'll take the next question. I will slack my property manager and I will get that to you. Yeah, just, and, and I don't know if anybody else has that question, but if you just wanna just reach out to me and get it to me, that would that would be fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Mitchell. Councilman Ledford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was an excellent question, Councilman Mitchell. Um, Martina, we sat down and talked uh, a while back about pilots and I'm excited to see you be able to bring one forth. So. We know that one of the things that we talked about uh, pre-COVID was uh, the cap that we set at pilots, which is $5 million. Are you able to tell us what the investment from c &E is on this project? Yeah, I believe it's 5.3 or 5.4 million. Okay, because uh, we know that's something that I've been interested in trying to actually figure a way to lower that. Um, any, more, any more projects like this in the near future? Uh, we have an incredible need for housing, and I'm glad to see c and &E being able to add on to the, the Maybell. Yeah, we've got, uh, well, we bought the four properties on Bailey, uh, the 22,000 block, I believe, that used to be those four dilapidated brown buildings right next to Big Brothers, Big Sisters, across from the church parking lot on Bailey. We bought those, we were able to um, um, tear down the, the lighted structures and we're now trying to figure out what we're going to build there. Um, so, but I don't, I don't think we'll, I, so I don't, I don't know if we'll get to the 5 million on those. Um, and then of course we're working with Collier Construction on their affordable housing in his development. So that's to be seen um, how that will build out in terms of reaching that 5 million threshold. But we have a pretty good pipeline in terms of the missing middle work that we've been doing. 
Very good. Keep us posted. Thank you. That's it, Councilman Letcher. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Chairman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When is when would this be scheduled to be in front of us? February uh, 4th, 5th, 16th. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman uh, Chairman Henderson, we are awaiting the final documents from um, our attorneys and CNE's attorneys, and it is intended to be on the agenda next Tuesday for your vote, uh, which would, there was a lot of discussion earlier about the HEB. It would be on the city council next Tuesday. It would be at, at the, before the HEB, the fourth Wednesday of the month, which I think is the 24th. And Councilman uh, Mitchell, if you're taking credit for Hicks Armor, I owe you a big favor because he is an excellent chair of the HEB. He's been amazing. And uh, finally, Chair uh, Oglesby, if I may, I do want to point out that when it comes to racial diversity in neighborhoods and, and uh, uh, buildings, it is illegal to engineer any type of racial, racial mix, however, uh, due to fair housing. However, what CNE has done a really good job of is making sure that their marketing is, is to a wide variety of potential tenants. And that is one of the ways that we can ensure um, that everyone who is interested and eligible for housing, that they are able to apply. And oftentimes that will yield a really good uh, mix, all kinds of diversity, not just racial, ethnically diverse, uh, diversity, as well as um, a mix in, in prices often means a diverse community. So they've done a really good job of that. Okay, thank you, Donna. Uh, Chairman, if you will, uh, let me circle to, to uh, Vice Chairman and then I'll double back to you. If that's okay. okay, sure, thank you. Yeah, all right, uh, Vice Chairman Smith, and then we'll circle back to Chairman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Martina. Um, it, was, it was great to have an opportunity to meet with you previously and discuss this. Uh, so my question is similar to, to what I've asked before. One, uh, it was great to see a slide of the types of workers that would be eligible for this and, and to put a, a different picture on it. Because again, uh, for me, an issue for eight years has been the word affordable because it means so many different things to different people. Uh, so it was good to see that. Um, just to be clear though, and you've got a number of units that are pilot restricted and a number of units that are home restricted. I think it totals up 40. Um, what is the salary max qualification? So we know some of the positions hourly that would be able to afford it, but what is the salary max? Uh, do, you, do you have that information in front of you? Because again, going back to affordability, it's one thing to have a unit at a, at a lower cost that, some, that more people can afford, but we don't necessarily want those available to somebody who could obviously uh, afford much more and take that away from somebody who can't. I think that's part of what we try to do with affordable. So do you have what? what the restriction is? Yes, uh, and I'm glad you raised that because we're being very intentional, even though under the pilot legally we could do an 80% AMI, that's not who we're going for. Our, our, we will go for, um, I'm looking at my rates here. So the, the um, for example, the 695 rent, is a $27,800 income to qualify. We use 30% of somebody's income, give or take, because we don't want people to not be able to get into a situation where they can't afford their rent. So that would be the, the targeted income for that. And then they would go up. So it's depending upon the rent, the 825 rent is 33,000. Oh, by the way, the 27,800 rent is a 55% AMI. Okay. And so we're really trying to be very conscious of making sure, and, and we get caught a little bit because as, as incomes have gone up and we stay at the AMI level, we realize, oh my gosh, we're the rent, the, then the folks that are allowed to live in our units, even of the voluntary, especially, um, we want to, we want to cap that. So we're looking at that. The $33,000 for an 825 um, unit, that's 65% AMI. Um, the 795 rent is uh, a 63% AMI. That's a $31,000 income. 
and then the most expensive rent of 850 is 34,000 and that's 69%. So you can see where, where the home money really plays in this 50 to 60 range and then the pilots can really help us stay between the 70 and 60% AMI. And that's, that's a really great sweet spot for us, I think. And that's great. And that's why I wanted to make sure to point that out because to your point, um, some of my issues again in the past was we're allowed to do 80%. And my question is always like, yeah, but how do we get down to 50, 60, 65%? Like, how do we get into that sweet spot to really help a larger uh, population that, that needs the assistance? So I just wanted to, to point that out, um, that that is also what this project does, is it's, it's servicing a lot more people that even other um, affordable um, projects have not been able to reach down to. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Sure. Uh, great question, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, Mr. Chair, may I, may I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And then after you finish, we're going to circle around to Councilwoman Coonrod. So go um, ahead, Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Smith, the the pilots that you all have, have uh, had before you, I would say every one of them in 2020, I'll, I'd have to check that were from developers who do stacked AMI. So um, none of those developers, I don't think, I'll have to check, uh, even though they got a pilot and could go to 80% of AMI, none of those units go up to 80%. They're at 30, 50, or 60. And um, the Maybell 2 is the only project that we have put both home funds in and a pilot into the project. And so by virtue of uh, the, the units being home fund units, which are restricted for 20 years at 60% of AMI and receiving a pilot, c &E agreed to um, maintain a lower than uh, traditional AMI because we have, uh, we have for the first time stacked incentives in a project that doesn't have um, low income tax credits or bond, um, uh, bond, bond funding in it. So you, you raise a really good point. And, and I always say a house costs what it costs and a building costs what it costs and it doesn't know who lives in it. So the cost is the cost. And the only way to get more people to the point where they can afford it is with some sort of incentives and, and subsidies. And um, this project does that. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Councilman Kumrai, you have the floor. Got gotcha. your- Thank uh, you, Chair. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for the presentation, Martina. I'm excited about it. I've been waiting on this to start getting into the developing phase as we, you know, met numerous times with Highland Park and they were on board, which led to the design of it. And, um, you know, what CNA does well and has always understood since Corker <laughs> came up with the brilliant idea that they understood the need for housing, starting with Lincoln Park and creating a missing middle and all of those great things. Like, I'm just really excited about the work that CNE continues to do throughout the communities. I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll be able to extend it all over the city of Chattanooga. Um, and then, so I'm really appreciative that you put the face with the employment that people have, because that, just last week we talked about the need of affordable housing and that people can't afford the places to live, but the breakdown clearly shows that if I'm a pharmacy tech that I can, and you know, it's, it's affordable to everybody except council members. Cause if we were expected with what we get, we, we will be homeless, right? Because we, we couldn't afford any property from anybody off of 20,000 a year. So, I mean, and I say that, you know, jokingly, but um, it just shows that uh, what you've created here, working with uh, Donna, with ECD and everybody, that it's affordable for people to live and apply. Now, if we shift ourselves from that mindset of poverty, then we can see the beauty of actually obtaining a place to live with quality housing. But the individual first have to see that and believe that and stop limiting themselves to, oh, because I make $10 an hour, I can't afford to live X, Y, and Z. And that's simply not true. So thank you again for your presentation. Great comment, Councilwoman. Um, Chairman Henderson, I said I would circle back to you. Do you have anything uh, you want to add to this? No, sir. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Uh, I see no other hands. Martina, thank you. This is a great presentation by Councilwoman Coomrod. I'm, I'm excited about it and, and, and what this can do for uh, other communities in our city. So if there's no other comments, uh, Madam Clerk, we can let Ms. Williams and Guilford go. And then I will turn this next section over to Council to Chair Coomrod in Youth and Family Development. Chair, can I get approval of the minutes? So moved. So everybody in agreement with it? Can we get a second? I'll give you a second. Second. Okay, great. All right, Madam Chair, if you go ahead with the minutes. Resolution authorizing the administrator for the Department of Youth and Family Development to enter into a blanket purchase agreement with the Electric Power Board to pay client services payment for the citizens of Chattanooga that qualify for assistance under the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program and the Community Services Block Grant Programs for a grant period of October 1, 2020 through September 30, 2023 in the amount of $8,025,500. All right, I see no hands. Um, so we can, you can bring in Coach Jennings and Rachel for the presentation. Good afternoon, y'all. Hi. Um, it's good to see you all. Donna Williams will also be joining me for the presentation. So if y'all could let her in as well, please. Okay. Right, so I guess we'll hear from um, Coach Jennings first. Coach, you got the floor. Yes, Madam Chair and members of the council. <clears throat> um, Thank you for the opportunity to share briefly and give you an update on how things have been going with uh, OFE and working in conjunction with Donna Williams, uh, ACD. Uh, we've had our challenges and people are struggling and hurting all over the city trying to get assistance and help. And uh, our team has been working close with Donna and trying to provide as much much opportunities and support to those families in great need, as you all know, uh, knocking down our doors and ringing our phones off the hook. So uh, I want Rachel to and Donna to, to share. Donna shared a little bit last week, uh, and Rachel has some similar uh, challenges that, that we've had to face in Office of Family Empowerment. But uh, it's a challenge, but we still got to do everything we can to get these families the support we need. And one of the challenges I know that I've been uh, slightly frustrated with just the many restrictions on these funds that we can't be as creative as we need to be to get the families the support that would be helpful to them. <clears throat> so at some point in time, as I would suggest, there will be some some lobbying to help change some of those restrictions that limit us to help the families in need. Uh, and I would uh, appeal to you all at some point to, to help us think through that uh, because we can do a lot more. We have the money and we can do a lot more with it if the, the restrictions weren't so great uh, upon us. So at saying that, I'd say we do the best we can, helping as many as we can with uh, the limitations that we have on us uh, within city government. So uh, Rachel, you and Donna can go ahead and share uh, the, 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 the details of how, how things happen and how we work to, to get the, the, the services to the families that, that need it the most. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Um, Madam Clerk, I believe that Tyler shared the presentation if you don't mind sharing that from your screen. You'll have to give me one second. Sure. Thank you, Coach. 
uh, well, uh, Ms. Campbell's doing that. Um, I want to say that one of the things that we found very interesting after having literally thousands of interactions with folks who requested rent and utility assistance is it's clear from looking at the data that a, a substantial percentage of these households were doomed for failure the day they moved into wherever they lived because they moved into a place they couldn't afford because there wasn't enough housing that they could afford. And uh, we have people who are living in places that rented for 400 a month and 425 a month that they couldn't afford um, because they have some of the, the jobs that uh, Martina showed you all and some other types of, of occupations that simply don't support the um, a, a quality place to live. So we've, uh, as Coach has said, we've had our hands full working, uh, our team ECD working with YFD very, very closely as we problem solve for the family. So um, Ms. Campbell, you're still getting your going. Okay, no, no problem. I wanna know if Rachel plays all those guitars back there. Yes, sir. Awesome. Not every day, once in a while. <laughs> Impressive. A woman of many talents. I was a music major. Oh, there you go. A woman then. Of many <laughs> That's a collection. Most of those are my husband's, but mine are back there too. Uh, another, uh, another thing for you guys to consider, thank you, uh, Miss Karen, is uh, you'll see that you probably already know this, that the state has received over $450 million. And Coach was alluding mm -hmm. to this a little while ago. Um, we, I often tell my team, you know, our problem is that we have a Platinum American Express, but people only take Visa and MasterCard. <laughs> so we have a lot of money, but the money that we have comes with so many restrictions that these are, this is our federal money, that many of our families uh, simply are not eligible. And so that's what Rachel and I are going to be talking about. And what one of the things you guys will be voting on this evening will help with that. So um, Karen, we can go to the next slide, please. American Express. Titanium, American Express. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to take it. Rachel, this is me. Okay, great. So just to give you some, you got some idea, when we say our teams are working on it, uh, you'll count those people. I don't know how many there are, but those, those are in, on my team, uh, with the exception of Sandra and I, the rest of that team, the team did not do anything related to housing pre-COVID. But we have been all hands on deck to serve these families and households that have been requesting assistance from us. And then Rachel has a tremendous team of folks who have been doing this uh, pre-COVID. They do uh, have been providing rent, mortgage, and utility assistance. Of course, they have some additional uh, resources too. And I, I kind of didn't want to put our community partners because there's so many, but these are the ones who have been helping us. Yeah. Ms. Donna, really quickly, um, because we heard a lot of that from you, I'm really interested in hearing from Rachel part. We you, you we will understand yeah. what ECD sure. is doing and have done. Just yeah. want to get to Rachel so she can present her YFD information and we can go ahead, move forward with our meeting. Sure. Well, uh, uh, Rachel, Rachel has slide three. She asked me <laughs> to make okay. sure you all knew about the partnership because yeah. these families are not assisted by one department or one organization. Right. Yeah, we're so, aware so of Rachel, that. you can uh, go to slide three. Okay. Um, can't, yeah. So um, this is throughout the city. This is the amount of, of funding that's been received under CARES from different federal grants um, to help people during the pandemic with rental and utility assistance. This includes um, CSBG, CDBG, um, LIHEAP, and I know I'm forgetting something of Donna's. Um, but that's a total of, ESG, thank you. That's a total of almost 6.5 million that's been received. Um, and of that, we've spent almost, we spent a little bit, about half. We've spent 3.2, we've got another 3.2 remaining to be spent. Um, and from that, we've assisted um, a total of over 12,000 individual residents that have been impacted by that assistance and received help with rent and utilities since, since the pandemic hit in March, 2020. And that's a breakdown of those funds. Um, 
where they've been allocated to and how much has been spent out of each of those grants. That's for rent and utilities, yeah. And then next slide. And the next one, there's our process. Donna, do you wanna start that out and I'll finish it? Yeah, again, because this process is not singular for one department or one uh, organization, um, I think that what we were asked to do, this will uh, help with that. So we, the residents, um, the constituent will make a request of either department and sometimes outside organizations. And then we have staff, both Rachel and I, who reach out to them by phone, email, whatever. And then that staff member will determine which program inside and outside the city that that constituent is eligible for. And right. then they are referred and, and Rachel uh, can talk about the referral because we refer to uh, uh, YFD a lot. And really it works both ways. So if, if they identify someone who is eligible for our programs or if we identify someone who's a better fit for theirs, then we refer back and forth. Um, once that the appropriate fit is identified either by their staff or by our staff, we try to make sure we make that connection for the person. Um, we have people that help them gather their information, their documentation that they have to have to apply for the services, um, get that application submitted to the proper department. Um, once we've done all our work on our end and done our um, sort of triaging of their needs and their income and all the things that they have to provide for us, um, when we're ready to make payment, we'll contact the landlord. The landlord will sign an agreement not to evict and to accept our funding. Um, and then we'll get a payment to the landlord. And the next slide. These are just some of the challenges that we have faced um, across both departments. Um, each fund has got a whole lot of restrictions on how it can be used and they vary from grant to grant. So um, I know with ECD's money that people are or in both of our situations, we're left out on their over income. Um, sometimes people are in non-traditional leases or employment. Um, currently we can't pay for a hotel. So that creates a challenge for some people that are living in a hotel. Um, people that are in public housing or on a voucher can't be assisted by ECD. Um, and if they're not impacted directly by COVID-19, they cannot be assisted by ECD. We do have some money to help if they have not been directly, if their situation is not directly impacted by COVID, but we do have a smaller amount of money for that, but we can't help in that situation in YFD. Um, ECD's requirements are that the family be at 80% of AMI or less, that they have to live within Chattanooga city limits and they have to be directly impacted by COVID. For us, we have a little more flexibility. Um, our income requirements are at 200% of the federal poverty guidelines or less, which is an increase that um, they were gracious enough to give us at the federal level this year um, to help us to serve more people that are impacted by the pandemic that wouldn't normally be eligible for our services. And this has been great. We're hoping they'll keep it at that permanently. Um, and we also only require to be a Hamilton County resident because we serve the entire county, not just city limits. So that helps us when Donna's team finds somebody in Ottawa or um, out there in the outlying parts of the county, they can send them to us and we'll be able to, to work with that family. And next slide. Donna, you want to talk about that? Sure. So uh, what, well, am I, am I muted? Can you hear me, Rachel? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so so what's next? Uh, one of the things, as I said before, one of the what's next is you're gonna be voting on a resolution uh, later this evening that will allow us to use some funds we already have, general fund dollars, to assist more families. Uh, Rachel's team and my team have been working uh, with a software provider to see if we can secure a system that allows for uh, us to process more quickly and confidentially um, files that we receive, applications that we receive from folks. And uh, really what we're all focused on together is taking that one request and working it throughout the system so that we can get the household served. I think that's it. That's it. Uh, Ms. Karen, you can remove the slide. Thank, um, thank you, Ms. Donna and Rachel for the control message. Um, but again, I just would have really liked to have, because we heard a lot from ECD, Ms. Karen, on last week. So a lot of this, we, we really already know what ECD is doing. Our focus of what council wanted to know is what youth and family development is doing under the Office of Family Empowerment. And so, I mean, 
I think y'all could have, you know, collaborated last week if it was a collaboration effort. Um, so, Rachel, my question to you is um, specifically um, with the wait list. How long is the wait list? How long have people been on this wait list? And what can be done to move people forward off the wait list? Because a lot of them aren't on the wait list, wait list due to COVID funds. So how can we help families and get them moved, streamlined through the process to really get the help that they need? Um, I can tell you, we've worked really hard on that. Um, a while back, the, the list was as many as 400 families. It's down to about 200 now, and the response time has been shortened by a couple of weeks. Um, we have a team that is working that list every day. They're calling people back and helping them get through the process, identifying what their needs are and helping them um, get connected to the appropriate application, the appropriate program. Um, we are also, we just finished strategic planning for OFE. And as part of that, we have a new staffing plan that we're looking to implement. It's gonna add some staff under that area. It's gonna create a navigation team that's gonna help people from, from the point that they want, that they seek services and help them get into the pipeline, help them get their applications completed, their documents completed and get them through that process to get them served more quickly. Um, it's been a challenge for us. I mean, we have two and a half staff effectively right now that are working to serve hundreds of people that need help. And we have continued to review the processes and see what we can do to move faster. Um, it's, been, it's, it's been a challenge, but we have, we have seen improvement and it will continue to improve as we improve our staffing situation. Okay, and is there a different phone number that people can um, contact you all along? Cause I've tried for two weeks and the mailbox is still full. Even today, this morning, it's still full. Is there an alternate number? Is there somebody specifically assigned to make phone calls back? Or are you making phone calls? Or, I mean, how are we handling it? We are using the 6434 number. Um, it has been, it, it gets very full over the weekends, I know. And, I'm, and Cheryl spends all day Monday and she spent all her morning this morning getting that cleaned out and calling people back. Um, we coach and I talked about this yesterday. We're working on ways to address that if it means expanding our voicemail box that we can hold more messages and make sure we get we capture everybody that calls in. Um, we're, we're working on a solution to that. Okay, and then um, one last question for me, and I don't know if my colleagues have any additional questions or ask. Um, so your presentation was mostly based on COVID in relation to what ECD has done. And, and both of you guys, you know, you're doing great things. We appreciate all that you're doing to make sure what happened the entire family. Um, so are the numbers you presented only related to COVID? And are people who's affected by COVID, are they getting first priority with your response? Or are you just kind of going through whoever call in or email? You're helping everybody as you go. We take them, um, as they come in, we're required to do first come, first serve, so first in, first out. Um, we are using different funding sources. So if people are impacted by COVID, we have funds directly related to that. If it's um, more of an extenuating circumstance, we have funding directly related to that. Um, but we are taking them in the order that they contact us. Okay. Well, I would like to for you to send me a breakdown of what's for COVID, the people we've helped with. OFE under the funds for COVID that you have and a breakdown of the people that you're helping that's not COVID related. So the numbers would more than likely look different. For what time period would you like to see that? So since we've been affected by COVID, and I think it's great that you all with the strategic plan had, are incorporating navigators because I, they worked well when um, you had those team, the team previously prior to COVID, but we weren't able to keep them on because of uh, grant funding. Um, so that team, we saw them out in the communities. They worked very hard. And at that time, it, it was still some challenges then with the process. So I don't know if, you know, once you all get them in the pipeline and then it gets to purchasing, if that's the problem or that's the issue, because what I'm hearing you saying is, well, we're, we're going as fast as we can. We're trying to get it get it processed and you know all that kind of thing not sure if maybe we need to have some additional accountability partners to make sure that the work once they process it the clerks or the data entry people that it gets to you to get it out to make sure that it's it's, it's getting done because people are in need of help right and we've stressed and said that this is urgent that people receive the help but if we're running into all these loopholes and people are still 
about to get put out, their utilities are getting cut off, then we need to really see, figure out what the true issue is because it may just be the process of how we're getting, the process, getting it done. Any colleagues have any, any questions, any concerns? All right. My hand raised. All right, Gilbert. Uh, you did say that you have two people actually working on this problem. They don't have any federal or state funds to hire more people to, like Councilwoman Kuran said, to help people along the process. That is what we are in the process of doing through our strategic plan is hiring several, I think it's six or eight positions we have that we are trying to create to hire people to help with the process and to speed things up and to have more hands in that work doing the data entry and processing things and getting people through that pipeline. Okay, thank you. Sure. Councilman Byrd. Thank you. Uh, is it possible uh, a lot of our centers are down right now? Is it possible to use our WIF staff to help out with that process? Uh, we have. I, I, oh, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry. We have looked at that within YFD and we have allocated some additional staff within YFD to help us um, with processing law heat this time. Yeah, and Councilman Bird, we, um, ECD and YFD, uh, have the same problem mm -hmm. because we get CDBG money, Community Development Block Grant money. They get CSBG money, same money, but for different purposes, same restrictions same uh, bottlenecks with regard to high levels of uh, documentation that has to be provided by the, the applicant. And uh, we actually, co co our team had collaborated and secured some folks from um, a, a local college who were fluent in Spanish. They were going to help us uh, collect the applications, meet with folks at the YFD centers applicants to help them fill out their application, make sure they knew exactly what we were looking for. If they needed, um, uh, they were Spanish speaking, they were bilingual, they could help them in written Spanish, spoken Spanish. But what we discovered is that the feds do not allow us to do that because of the level of confidentiality that's required. And so um, uh, again, I know Councilwoman Kumar, I don't want to talk about this, but the, the reason you all are voting for us to amend the guidelines for the affordable housing fund is because the restrictions that come with CDBG and CSBG are so substantial that many of these families simply cannot provide the required documentation that is not negotiable if HUD or any other federal agency were to come and audit our files. So is it, is it slower than, than uh, Rachel wants and I want? Absolutely, but it's not, could we use more people? Yes, we could. But the, the, the bottleneck, if you look at the workflow, the bottleneck is in the requirements and the level of documentation that has to be provided by the applicant. So the, the affordable housing fund guidelines will help both YFD and ECD serve more folks. And Donna, uh... Uh, and Madam Chair, Rachel didn't mention that uh, her team has been hit by COVID uh, pretty hard as well. There's a, quite a few of, of her team members that was affected by COVID and was out, which handicapped our ability to, to move things as rapidly as we, we'd like to. So that was another piece in the mix that interfered with our delivery. That's true. Thank you, Coach. Uh, Gilbert. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Donna, is anyone, I know that we are not the only city that's having the same problem. Is anyone lobbying, lobbying the Congress and Senate to get some type of relief, relief from the restrictions? Yes. Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, we will have a new secretary of uh, HUD if, if that hadn't happened already. Uh, and that, those are the types of things that they're working on. They're saying, okay, you guys have given us some level of relief and they have, they, they've given us some things that are super helpful, but what they have not relaxed is the level of documentation because many of our applicants, they are from non-traditional working environments. 
And some of the things that we're asking for that we're required to have, many of these applicants is very difficult for them to get them. So, you know, we have folks both on YFD side and ECD side who they can't find their leases uh, and they're behind on their rent and their landlords aren't trying to help them find their leases. So our staff is working with some landlords attorneys to talk the landlords into giving us leases that the landlords told the tenants they're not going to give them. Uh, so it, it's, it's very labor intensive, um, the work that we have to do in order to make sure that if the city of Chattanooga is ever audited for these federal funds, that we don't come up short because we did not do what was required of us to do and jeopardize any future allocations of federal, federal dollars. So Councilwoman Kuhn, while we're working real hard to, to make things go faster, uh, you guys are here more uh, about um, a, a system that we are investigating that's being used in a couple of big cities across the country that really will be transformative for us and for our applicants. And, and you mentioned, you know, the, the, the phones being busy and um, clogged up. Um, some of the applicants, in fact, most applicants that we engage with, we have to uh, communicate with them and they, and they to us multiple times. So you can just imagine their frustration when they're trying to call mm -hmm. back the second time, the third time, when, whenever they can, and, you know, they're trying to figure it out. And so we're working real hard as a team to, to alleviate as many barriers as we can. So uh, it, it's frustrating. We know that we're not insensitive to it. And uh, we, we, from day one, we started working on this and collaborating both of our departments to see what we could do and combine our, and combine our funds too because the federal money allows for some portion mm -hmm. of it to be used for admin costs with staff and software and things like that. And in order for us to get what we need, we need to combine some of our um, federal funds to be able to do it. Thank you, I appreciate it, Donna. But, and I'm gonna say this, and I got a couple of other concerns and then I'm gonna end. I'm not sure why when we ask for a committee report from Office of Family of Empowerment that everybody, gets in the mix and not allow Rachel to make her presentation. As a chair of YFD, I feel I'm offended by that. She, as the director of Office of Family Empowerment, she should be able to provide us with and answer our questions that we're asking her with, and coach is over her. So he should be the one, and it's nothing to take away from you, Ms. Donna, but you two, are in two different departments. And I, I understand what you're doing. And the guidelines are totally different. OFE, they, the requirement is not to provide a lease. They need a late notice from the landlords. It's two different processes. So someone not able to provide Rachel a lease is not an issue. It's their issues are not, that some may be similar, but not every single one of them. And you all are presenting it as if is similar across the board and that's simply not true. So, um, and then also I know that although we've had challenges with COVID with our employees at OFE, they've been working from home. So, um, but again, thank you so much for the presentation. Although we're not gonna get the accurate answers because I don't know who won't allow this young lady and she's fully capable of presenting her job to us. And, and I just don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. Rachel, please um, send us the information that we've requested, or I don't know if we need to get that permission for you to do that from somebody else, but we're simply asking for the right information so we can know how to service and help our community members. We've got 2,149 people or more on a waiting list, and we just want to know how we can help streamline the process to get them help. It's not helping us by you all giving us this stripped case. We need to be honest. But again, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, Rachel. I look forward to receiving your email. Please send it to the council clerk so the entire council can receive it. Thank you so much. Chair, you- and Council Warren, right. let me apologize. I, I, my understanding was that the council had asked what the city was doing to no. assist can, uh, constituents with COVID. So. I, I apologize. We, we haven't been working in a silo. And uh, I, I echo what you're saying. Rachel is more than capable of representing what YFD does. And uh, we, we, she's been a great partner 
and you're right, her program, she can, she can pay one month of rent. Our program, we can pay many months of rent. And so that's why we work together. She pays one and then we can, we're able to work the other. But I, I apologize, I, mis, I, I misunderstood what the, what the request was for counsel. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. Chair, you've got the floor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, I guess at this time, Madam Clerk, you can excuse our current guest. And we will get ready to uh, bring on the other guest as we go into planning and zoning. So at this time, I will turn the chair over to Councilman Ledford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to call to order our planning and zoning committee for today. If I can get approval for minutes, please. I moved. All right, without objection, the minutes are accepted. Mr. Bridger, um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring in John Bridger for me. And before we get started, uh, Dr. Burrs, we have a clarification for the item case number 0179 that is to, to be put on next Tuesday's February 9th for first reading, is that correct? It is correct, and uh, but I want to discuss it today because there are some conditions that need to be added. Yes, ma'am. We will discuss that. That will actually be our first case this afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Mr. Bridger, good afternoon. If you'll unmute your mic, we'll get, uh, we'll get started on ordinances for next week, Tuesday, February 9th. John, let's go ahead and start with case 0179. Yeah, we, I, we, since I briefed you all uh, a couple of weeks ago, what I'll do is just cover, I guess, the conditions. This is, again, a request on Shallowford Road for rezoning uh, to 01. And I think um, I've been in communication with Councilwoman Burrs, and I think she would like to, to – we're adding some conditions to ensure, basically to go with the zone. And I'll just kind of give an overview of those and see if anybody has any questions. Um, some of these are the standard 01 conditions we use for office – uh, zones in in and around neighborhoods. So those conditions would be uh, one business hours limited to between seven and nine, uh, no dumpster service between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m., lighting a direct way from all residential areas, and then any sign is limited to a monument sign with a maximum height of four feet and 48 square feet in area per sign surface. Um, the I think uh, Councilman Burrs would also like to have the site plan attached to the ordinance as a listed condition. Yes, that's true. All of that is true. And also, um, John, because it backs up on a neighborhood, it's at the back of the property. I'd like to go for the heavier duty buffer. That we That'd be the type B for a 20 yeah. of a 10? Yeah. So I'm assuming you would you like uh, Phil and I to coordinate on getting those conditions together for you in an alternative res resolution? Please. Yeah, please do. Those are the normal conditions that we have with offices that back up on neighborhoods. So I really want them included. Okay. Very good. So for clarity's purposes, Phil, are we going to present that as an alternate version for six o'clock with those conditions? Next so week. We do not have to condition that with. Okay. Yes. As long as that is six o'clock next week, correct? Or is it tonight? It's six o'clock next week. Okay. All right. February 9th. Yes, sir. So first we first reading is next week and second reading is the following week. And John, how do we get um, the notice of these conditions? The people have been a little bit difficult to uh, sure. yeah. So how I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna, what I'll do is once you've confirmed a list of conditions, I'll send an email out to uh, uh, Ledford novel and your attention and then make sure that those are what you agree to. Then once I get that conf confirmation, I'll forward it on to the applicant as an FYI. If, yeah, if you would send that to me and let me say, yeah, that's it. And then we can forward it on. Thank you very much, John and well, Mr. Chair. Thank you, madam, for your, uh, your hard work on that case. I appreciate it. I do have a, a councilman Mitchell's hand is up. If he, you're on mute, sir. Councilman Mitchell. You're muted, sir. Thank you. Um, is this not on tonight's agenda? Is six A not what we're talking about right now? Yeah, this was supposed to be heard. Uh, that's a I would call that Phil a clerical error. We had called for this to be in planning and zoning committee meeting today and on for February 9th. 
Okay, so we just have to defer till February 9th because it's on the agenda. Yes. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Thank uh, you. I'm, I'm, I'm unconfused. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you for that point out. All right. Moving on to our next case. John, you ready for 6A? Yes. Case number 0003. And I'll start sharing my screen for these. Thank you. One second. Let's see. And I'm going to. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, this is a request to rezone. Get the next slide here. From M2 Manufacturing Zone to C2 Convenience Commercial Zone for a proposed retail store and offices. Um, this property is located in the Hill City area um, in District 2 at the intersection of Hamilton Avenue and North Market Street. Uh, if you look at the zoning of this area, it does have a mix of M2 commercial and residential zone types. Um, there is no history of, of zoning in this area, in this immediate area. Um, if you look at the land use, this is also a mix. You've got some single family across the street, but you also have commercial development to the north, office across the street to the west, and single family to the north. Um, the Hill City Northside Neighborhood Plan recommends business technology. So it would recommend a commercial type use for this location. Um, staff uh, did not have any issues with the use proposed, but we do recommend a different zone than C2. C2 is more appropriate for you, more your uh, strip commercial highway type development. This is more urban. And so staff just basically recommended to deny the C2, but approve UGC subject to some conditions. As you see on your screen, that first condition would limit the uses, the kind of limit out those auto-oriented uses and heavier in, uh, commercial uses that would not be appropriate for that neighborhood. It also puts a limit on the number of stories because you know UGC allows you to go up to four. This would limit it to uh, two and a half stories or 35 feet. Um, at Planning Commission, there was no opposition. Um, the uh, Planning Commission did hear staff's recommendation and from the applicant. The applicant was fine with staff's recommendation for UGC with these conditions. So based on that feedback, Planning Commission concurred with staff's recommendation to approve this for UGC with the two conditions I just covered. Very good, thanks, John. Before I call on Councilman Mitchell, Phil, can we make sure that that says in the caption UGC instead of C2 or yeah. the addition of that? I, I see that does not mention UGC. Okay. And Councilman Mitchell, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. That, that was exactly where I was going. And we've been noticed as C2. Is it okay just to uh, um, next week? I guess, I guess we've got a week on it to, to notice the change. So I guess there wouldn't be a problem in just pursuing that, would it, Mr. Noble? No, sir. As long as we got a week, we should be fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. All right, John, let's move on to case B, uh, 0012. Sure, um, this is a request to resume from R1 residential to R2 residential zone for an existing duplex. It's currently vacant uh, to allow them to use it as a duplex. Um, this property is located in the East Lake area, uh, adjacent to Rossville Boulevard. You see there a little bit to the left of the site. Uh, it's currently again addressed on Clio Avenue. Um, if you look at the zoning of the area, it's predominantly residential, but you do have, it backs up to commercial zoning along uh, Rossville Boulevard. Um, this property was down zoned as part of a neighborhood down zoning that occurred after the adoption of the Rossville Boulevard community plan. Uh, if you look at the land use, it's mostly single family, although the, again, this site has a duplex structure on it. Um, the Rossville Boulevard community plan does uh, include duplexes as part of this recommendation is called low density residential and allows for some exceptions for townhouses, patio homes, and two family dwellings if the density is compatible. Um, so again, based on the, the, you know, the breadth allowed in that land use recommendation, as we know, we all have, you just heard from some of the presentations about affordable housing needs in our city. Um, in fact, this is a vacant existing duplex. It's not proposing a new one. It's already a duplex. Staff recommended to approve at Planning Commission, there was no opposition. Um, so uh, Planning Commission concurred with staff's recommendation to approve. Very good. John, was this a down zoning from the uh, power and EPB situation we see so often? Uh, you, I, I'm not sure of the details of that, but often that's the case. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Councilman Oglesby, do you have any comments you'd like to make? 
No, no, uh, not at all. This this is a, a great. I'm I'm glad the Planning Commission agreed to do this because I know we were talking about doing some legislation where when we had those situations where uh, it was down zone because of lack of, of um, electricity, but but this to be approved, I, I'm extremely pleased. So um, just looking forward to voting on it next week. Very good, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Seeing no other hands, John, let's move on to item C0015. Sure. Um, this is a request to rezone from M1 Manufacturing to UGC General Commercial for a proposed mixed use commercial and residential development. Um, this uh, property is located along Main Street between Holtz Claw and Central. So if you think of where the National Cemetery is in Montague Park, it's in that block area along Central Avenue. Um, I, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way, guys. My bad. Did something to our screen. Let me jump ahead. Okay, here we go. Um, as you look at the zoning of this area, there's already UGC uh, zoning in this area. So this not, wouldn't be the first time that UGC was approved for this location. Um, the, uh, again, it looks at the zoning history here. Uh, we've had several requests that have been approved for UGC. Uh, they'll actually go all the way back to 2009. So we've had a 2016 and 2018, several properties have been rezoned in this block to UGC. Um, there is a single family structure just to the east of this property. You see the little single family residence. I'm going to move my cursor right here. Um, that's the one person we did who, who came in opposition to this request. I think there's a little bit of confusion about how this proposal would affect the zoning of her property. And we clarified during the meeting that this would not change the zoning of her property. I think that helped answer some of her concerns. Um, but again, this would be just for this property you see right here. Um, you do see a mix of residential uh, single family, uh, multifamily, and office in this area. Um, the adopted Area 3 plan recommends urban corridor place type. So the UGC zone is com consistent with that vision of having that more shop front urban uh, scale commercial development along the Main Street corridor. So based on the recommendations of the Area 3 plan and existing uh, already case history of approving UGC in this area, staff recommended approval with some conditions uh, limiting out those more auto-oriented uses like drive-throughs, uh, self-storage facilities, wholesaling, and accessory warehousing uses. Um, again, as I said, as Planning Commission, there was one individual who came out in opposition. They were just had some questions about how this zoning affected the zoning of their property. After hearing from the applicant, the opposition, and staff's recommendation, Planning Commission recommended to approve with the condition I noted. Very good. And John might add that the property of the adjacent uh, uh, next door was zoned M1, so that might have caused some confusion with the request on this case. So, you know, if the app, the uh, next door property owner ever reached out for any more clarification? No, not that I'm aware of. Then I think we, we did a good job at that. So, Councilman Bird, do you have any comments you'd like to make? So, John, do we have a, a site plan? Do we know anything what they're trying to build there? I'll show you the site plan. It is right here. As you can see, they're proposing a building that's gonna be fronting on Main Street. Uh, this is that single family house. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, single family houses over here. Um, mm -hmm. There's an existing building that's already on the site and you see they got their parking to the rear. Right, okay, okay, thank you. You good, Councilman? Yes, I thought, yeah, he answered it. Thank you so much. Very good, sir, thank you. All right, John, let's move on to D, case number 008. Yes, this is a request to lift a condition regarding the retention of easement and sewer and stormwater drainage. Uh, if you're familiar with the Lucy Boiler site um, that's being redeveloped, uh, this is basically doing some cleanup of condition language for them to continue with their proposed development program. Um, so they're requesting a lifting this condition in order so they can move the easements and they are already applying to uh, move those easements as part of the uh, review process. Uh, again, this shows you to your right, this area you see the current site plan. Um, this is the area that they're having to uh, potentially, you know, again, move that easement, have the flexibility to move that utility easement. Um, and there's already an administrative process in, in, ha in place for reviewing that. So we'll have a chance to look at that as part of the standard review process. So the, the staff feel like the condition is not needed. We've already got a review process that's set up to handle any kind of request to change utility easements. The staff recommended approval of lifting that condition. Um, there was no opposition at Planning Commission. Planning Commission concurred with staff's recommendation to approve. Very good. Councilwoman Coonrod, any comments? 
no comments. All right, that project's moving along, very good. All right, John, we've got 7F, a special exceptions permit, case yes. number 005. Yes, this is a request for a special permit for a proposed residential subdivision. This is along Reeds Lake Road. It's about 50 acres and proposing about 225 units. Um, again, location, this is located just north of Mount, or actually along Mountain Creek Road, north of Morris, Morris Hill Springs Road. I'll say that right, Morrison Springs Road. Um, so uh, you can see the site there. Um, the current zoning of this property is R1. I'll just give you a little history. Um, this, there's actually was a, a original PUD uh, approved in this area in 1971. Um, then and uh, later on in the mid 70s, um, the part of the Reeds Lake was, was rezoned to R4 and the clubhouse was removed from the PUD plan in 1972. Then in 1980, um, that location was rezoned to C1 Highway Commercial uh, to, to enable that clubhouse to be able to serve alcohol on site. Um, then in 2002, as part of a citywide rezoning study, it was rezoned to C2 Convenience Commercial from C1. Um, then in 2018, um, there was a request to rezone this property from C2 to R4, um, <laughs> as well as a PUD. Uh, that request was later withdrawn by the applicant. Um, then in 2018, later that year, um, the C2 portion was rezoned to C2 with conditions that were basically the conditions consistent with the C1 uses at the time. Um, the uh, other zoning, I guess, just in terms of recent zoning history, just to be aware of, uh, there was a PUD approved for uh, just to the west of this property for a 73 unit development in 2001. Um, just to give you an idea of the mix of land, there really is a wide range of uh, land use in terms of residential types in this area. I would say most of your single family is to the north of Reeds Lake Road with one exception, uh, which I'll share with you in a minute. Um, but most of your residential development patterns north of Reeds Lake is single family residential. To the south, you have both multifamily townhouses uh, and some uh, single family, uh, I'll call small lot residential. Um, there is no adopted plan for this location. Um, the comp plan basically identifies this as level one and level two. Level one is, you know, basically where they're showing where there's existing floodways, floodplains uh, that need to be considered. Level two is basically our areas that are sparsely or moderately populated that's intended for what I call low intensity development. Um, if you look at the site itself in terms of what's there currently, um, uh, the portion of the site, particularly that's south of Mountain Creek Road, is, has um, floodway and floodplain. The light blue you see on your screen is the floodway, uh, which you cannot uh, develop on unless you uh, do some kind of a modification um, uh, study. And then you have the floodplain. You can develop that uh, uh, up, up to a certain point. So um, just to be mindful in terms of what happens, what we do at this stage and what happens later, um, typically at this stage, there is not any formal civil engineering done. A lot that happens after a PUD plan is pre what the PUD plan does essentially lays out your location for your open space, the mix type of residential units. Um, but there still has to be additional review as it relates to doing your stormwater uh, review and so on. And so that could actually cause you to lose additional lots but this would basically set the overall pattern for your housing unit mix and your open spaces. Um, getting into the overall uh, PUD plan, um, it was presented in several sheets as part of the application. And you'll hear me say sheet two, which is this uh, far upper northwestern portion that's closest to Signal Mountain. Uh, then you have sheet three, uh, which is right adjacent to uh, at the intersection of Reeves Lake Road and Mountain Creek Road. Sheet four is when you start to get south of uh, Mountain Creek Road. Uh, and then sheet five, uh, that's, that's where you have the apartments components to it. Okay, so just kind of give you an overview of each of those. Uh, segment one, or we call sheet sheet one, um, as you can see kind of outlined it where I've got it down here where it's an overall PUD plan. Um, this is, they're not proposing any structures in this segment as shown as all it's open space. Uh, but staff just want to be clear that even though you designate something as open space does not mean there cannot be any clearing. Um, I think one of the things that's been noted in the past that there's an existing post oak tree of significance in this area, uh, but without any additional conditions that you know, there's no guarantee that none of the additional site will be cleared. Um, segment two, um, they're proposing 33 townhomes uh, with a cul-de-sac that's accessing off of Mountain Creek Road. 
Um, and then you see a portion of the site to the north uh, and west is being proposed as open space. The darker green you see there is that existing stream buffer of, of 30 feet. Segment three um, shows again, um, the townhomes is getting south of Mountain Creek Road. You see I've shown the floodway in pink there. Um, that's where you, again, you're currently not allowed to build units uh, unless you do some kind of a uh, hydrology study to modify that boundary. Um, but they're proposing, again, 52 attached townhomes that will be accessing off of Reeds Lake Road. Um, staff did, in looking at this request, recommend an additional uh, buffer along where the townhomes abut. There's a single family, large lot, single family home just to the north of this property. And staff was recommending a type A buffer along that edge. Um, segment four, this is where your multifamily is being proposed. Uh, they're proposing 140 multifamily dwellings. Uh, you can see it's basically in three clusters. You have one cluster here on the north side of, of uh, Reeds Lake Road. Then you have another cluster to the south and a larger cluster. And just to give you an idea how kind of where it situ situates based on the existing floodway and power line easements, um, the blue you see is those existing overhead power line easements that go through the property. And then the pink is your existing floodway. Um, and it's our understanding uh, from uh, the applicant that they're planning on submitting a hydrology study to amend the existing floodway boundary, uh, which would be reviewed by TEMA at the state. Um, there was some, uh, I think some, we got some feedback after the meeting about density. And so I just wanna be real clear to clarify what's gross density and what's net density. Um, you know, gross density just looks at the total number of units and divides it by the total acreage, right? It doesn't account for unbuildable land. Uh, net density, you try to take into factor consideration more of those things that would not typically be allowed to build on. Um, and so what I did just to kind of help sh you, can look, you look at those numbers is basically take out the floodway and the power line easement uh, from the overall project acreage to get a, a net density dumber. So if you look at the total site, it's about 50 acres, about 20 of acres of that is floodway and power line easement. Um, so if you look at the total units proposed of 225 units, you get a gross density of 4.5 units per acre and net density of 7.2 units per acre. So just, you know, just to be real clear about uh, that. Um, to give you an idea how that compares to the area around it, um, here you see a development, let me to my notes here just one second. So follow along. Um, this, this is a, 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 a residential development to the southeast along Westview Road, showing a density of about six dwelling units per acre. You see the site outlined in yellow, which would be just to the northwest of this location. So. Um, here across the street, you have the um, Spring Lake subdivision, which has a density of about three dwelling units per acre. Um, here is the condo development, uh, which is known as Montclair East Condominiums. It has a density of about 1.7 dwelling units per acre. Um, then to the north, um, you have both a large lot single family residence, as I mentioned right here, and a subdivision. And we just basically look at all that together and had a density of about two units per acre. Um, to the immediate west of this location, um, the, uh, the Lynx apartment homes has a density of about 10 units per acre. Um, the townhouses, uh, the, again, the PUD is over here uh, that immediately butt this to the uh, west has a density of about five units per acre. Uh, and then you can see here again, the gross density for uh, uh, an adjacent development about six units per acre. Um, you do have some apartments on the uh, west across uh, Mountain Creek Road, which has a density of about nine units per acre. And I think you really get lower density once you get to the west and north along Mountain Creek Road. This is actually 0.3 units per acre, which means basically your average lot size is about three acres. So you know, get much larger residential state lot type development as you proceed up to the north. So um, the way we looked at it as staff is based on the existing mix of residential land uses in the area. Um, and it, the, the basic, for the most part, the uh, we, uh, staff and our end looked at basically Reeds Lake Road is kind of like that dividing line between we you have your uh, more, you know, more mix of housing types and single family. Um, we looked at, again, the PUD plan currently is proposing about 20 acres of open space, about 42% of the site area. So, uh, we recommend approval subject to that buffer, as I mentioned, along that edge where townhomes are proposed next to the single family. Um, there was opposition at Planning Commission, and I've, I've kind of listed all the points um, that were made during that meeting. 
Uh, and I'm just gonna cover them uh, here. Uh, concern about the development or fill of that existing Reeves Lake. Um, the concern about there's already existing homes in the area that are having trouble with underground springs. Um, that the proposed development is too intense compared to surrounding residential development. Um, the, the concern that that green space is mostly floodway and power line easement. Um, the concern was expressed that there wasn't any collaboration between the developer and the residents of the PUD plan. Um, existing residents are already impacted by flooding in this area. And there's a concern that with this development, it might increase some of the flooding issues in that area. Um, a lot of opposition, uh, again, preferred single family only, um, not having any multifamily or townhomes in the area. Um, they also expressed a desire to increase the buffering around the project. Uh, and then finally, the Westview Road, uh, some residents noted that it already has a lot of cut through traffic and it's a narrow road with no sidewalks and the concern about safety. So there was, those are all the concerns that were mentioned at the meeting. Um, so the applicant, of course they heard from the applicant um, and uh, the opposition and then based on the feedback from staff, the applicant and opposition, uh, planning commission, it was an eight to three vote uh, recommended to approve it subject to that condition recommended by staff. Very good, thank you, John. I see some hands are in line, so I will take our chairman, Chip Henderson, first. Um, Mr. Chair, if you would go, uh, I, I, I would defer to uh, our other council people to let their questions get answered first. Very good, sir. Uh, I do not know who was next, Councilman Mitchell or Dr. Burrs, but I'm gonna call him Dr. Burrs. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I really think Councilman Mitchell was first. Jerry, do you want to go or do you want me to? No, you lead the way. All right. Um, so this is this is a question for um, for our attorney. Yes, ma'am. Do we still need the screen up? I can stop share if you like. Yeah, let's do that, John. Okay. There we go. Let's see everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just have a question for our attorney. There's been a lot of energy about this, a lot of noise on the line about this, and I need some clarification just for me and for the record. Is this, and I'm talking just about the PUD, which is you know a terrific idea, but is it part of the settlement of any lawsuit? No, ma'am, it does not include the current lawsuit, which involves a 2.5 acre portion of this property okay. that is not included in this PUD. Okay, so in no way is this connected uh, as a result of any talk about settlement of the lawsuit. No, ma'am, it is all around that's, it, though. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burrs. Councilman Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, John, you'll help me get to the right question if I don't ask it exactly correctly at first. First, well, first part, what is this zone right now? R1. R1. So give me uh, taking floodway, floodplain, power easement into account. R1, um, what's the net number of units that could be done in this existing uh, piece of property as it is now zoned. So if you, yeah, you know, assumption that I took out 20 acres for those impediments, uh, that leaves you 30. So, you know, you get anywhere from four to five. So that's 120 to 150. Okay. You said four to five. I thought it was four per acre when you're in R1. Is that? Uh, it varies depending on what you do with your roads. So that's, that's why I gave you a range, 120 to 150. Okay. So max 150. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman. Chairman Henderson, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I noticed Blythe Bailey is in attendance. Could we bring in him in for just a minute, please? I'd be happy to. Can we bring Mr. Bailey in? Hello, members of the council. Hello, Mr. Bailey. Uh, Chairman Henderson, I believe, has a question for you, sir. Sure. Hey, Mr. Bailey, thank you. Um, so my question is, goes back to um, staff report and compatibility with the comprehensive plan, uh, as well as compatibility with the regional transportation plan. And I found it interesting uh, that uh, 
the box yes or no was not checked. It was just see comment. So I, I guess maybe I need a, a little further clarification. In the comprehensive plan, it ad identifies this area as intensity levels one and two, which I'm assuming that's the lowest level of intensity. Uh, and it says these areas have a limited transportation network, therefore are more suitable or more suited for low intensity development. And then with the regional transportation plan, it talks about uh, priority area for building connectivity. And as I look at each of these sheets, I see five cul-de-sacs, which I hear you talk a lot about um, trying to do away with cul-de-sacs and create connectivity. Could, could you, from a transportation standpoint, I guess, address and I'm, and I'm most concerned about uh, the apartments that are there uh, north on Reach Lake Road, further into and away from um, even Mountain Creek Road and uh, away from Morrison Springs Road, uh, puts it closer to Westview Road, which has already been noted. It's narrow, it has no shoulders, it has uh, sort of deep ditches on both sides. Could, could you sort of describe uh, the effects maybe of putting a, a more high density development in a what's recommended for a low intensity development uh, network and 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 the connectivity that it that the um, regional transportation plan talks about. Um, <clears throat> let me. Chairman, there was a lot in there, um, and I'm familiar with the staff report. <laughs> yeah. I'm certainly familiar with the case. Um, can you can you just can I ask you again just to, to ask the question again, um, so I can make sure I give you give you the right answer. Well, I'm I'm trying to understand. Um, so I'm trying to understand and make sense of the uh, of the staff report when it says these areas have a limited transportation network. And, and if they're talking about a low intensity development and we're trying to shoehorn something in here that maybe was not designed or fitted for that, you know, what, what could be the result, I guess, um, of, of trying to shoehorn a development that's really not suited for limited transportation network? Uh, and I'll give you, for instance, last week, uh, or week before we, we talked a lot, this council talked a lot about budgeting for priorities and, and nearly every council person had concerns for number one, traffic, uh, uh, traffic calming. And, and we already have uh, uh, traffic calming down uh, Mountain View because it is uh, sort of a cut through, but we've, we've put the multifamily, the high, what I would consider high intensity, uh, Further north, away from uh, from mountain or uh, from uh, Mountain Creek Road, I, I'm trying to understand the consequences, I guess, of of doing so, and and help me understand um, when an area is is recommended or suited for low intensity, what that development should look like. Does that does that um, help you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I think so. I may not be able to answer your question directly and exactly the way you're asking it, um, Mr. Chairman, but um, we do we do um, work with the regional planning agency in the review of um, zoning cases. And I, for a moment, give some kudos to Mr. Bridger and his staff. The comprehensive plan has a number of things that are really useful to us as we look at transportation infrastructure and how it can or can't support development and one of those things is the intensity level which you which you mentioned in your comments um i think uh the intensity level that was identified is one or two um for for this piece of property um and so and that's you can see in your staff report in the in the documentation that you've got for this case how level two is characterized level one of course is the lowest intensity well, let me stop for a second and say we look at those intensities when we try to figure out what level of transportation infrastructure is available because the transportation infrastructure is embedded in the intensity analysis. So a, a low intensity tends to mean that um, 
the development intensity should be low and, and, and so on as you increase. So the higher the intensity, the more intense the development can be from a transportation infrastructure. It's not just transportation, but it's included in that. And level, the level two, I think, um, does suggest that um, a, a low intensity, which, which you know, the, the multifamily housing that you said you, you wanted to focus on, that's, I think, segment four is, is perhaps above that, that intensity level. Um, and then the other thing that, um, that is important to us that was also mentioned in the staff report, us being CDOT was also mentioned in the staff report, was the, the, the presence of multifamily housing now seems to be fairly well accommodated closer to Morrison Springs Road. And the, the site plan that was presented in the PUD the, the, the segment four does not abut Morrison Springs Road, but it is between, there is some underdeveloped land between that site and Morrison Springs Road such that you could potentially one day connect, but the site plan creates a permanent dead end in the way that the, the buildings are arranged on that site. So there would be no way to ever connect to Morrison Springs Road, which would be very useful from a transportation standpoint as it relates to the intensity of this development. I hope that helps answer your question. Well, okay. So I think what I heard you say is, is this development is above the intensity level that this area is suited for. Is that, is that a correct statement? I, the, I think what's in segment four is above, is above a low intensity. Yes. Okay. Okay. From a transportation standpoint. Okay. And, and as far as uh, moving down to the uh, regional transportation plan, uh, it's a priority area for building connectivity. Does that does that refer to roads connecting to roads, or I guess what I'm asking, and and I know um, I've I've heard you comment before about trying to get away from cul-de-sacs, dead ends, so to speak. Does that does that is that what that is speaking to? This is a priority area for building connectivity. Is is roads connecting to roads? Yeah, the, those and Mr. Bridger, you step in because your your report I have cited on multiple occasions. That is also a really really good piece of work that the regional planning agency has done, um, called the People Places Path Study, and it gets referenced. It's not regulatory, um, but it gets referenced in the staff reports. And we do use that as well. Um, to answer your question from a transportation standpoint, Mr. Chairman, and then maybe Mr. Bridger can, can add to it as it relates to, to the staff report and how it references that. Um, you, many of us know the experience that we had, um, that we have in, in emergency situations when there's only one way in and one way out, it can create, um, it can create safety issues when you have one way in and one way out, but it's also a convenience issue um, when, when you have to drive down to the collector road and then around to the arterial road and then over to the major road to really only go a quarter of a mile, it's not the most efficient thing in the world. And it means that all the traffic has to be on all the same roads, which so it's, it exacerbates congestion problems and also really doesn't really enable um, choices for people. So we generally do try to provide multiple options for how people can get around in terms of routes and connectivity and um, that's why we lean so much on that report, um, especially when you're talking about an in, a more intense development. Um, it, you can create a lot of convenience, a lot of safety, um, and a lot more options for people if you create more than one way to get to and from where you're coming. Okay. And that's, I think, what that, that comment is meant to reference that, that study that is fundamentally about connectivity of land development. I don't know, Mr. Bridger, did I, did I butcher your, your study or does that do, does okay? I could maybe add a couple of just clarifying remarks, if I may, Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir, please. Yeah. So I think the um, so as far as the, the 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 reason we put that information, the traffic is to make you aware of where connection can add value. That we don't have a policy, so we're trying to at least provide good information. So as people look at new developments, there's an option that's being explored for making those connections. So because there is not a requirement to do it, um, we at least try to make that as an informational resource. And I think what Blythe is speaking to, we did a study that talked about some of the benefits of providing connectivity in terms of emergency response and, and connecting people to everyday resources like schools and parks. So what we try to do is we, when we find locations that could benefit from that, we put a note in there 
um, because again, we don't have a formal policy in place. So in lieu of that, well, at least we're trying to make people aware of where there's potential opportunities for that that can occur. Um, and what I would add uh, to Blythe's comments on the comp plan, as you know, the comp plan is a, I call it a very high level document um, at the 80,000 square foot level. It kind of gives you a general view of kind of what we're looking at in terms of intensity, but, but when we don't have an area plan, we don't stop there. We also look at the zoning in the area and the land use patterns. And, and, it, and, it, and it was something we certainly wrestled with based on the, you know, the comp plan. If it's recommending one and two, what about this development? I think where we ended up was because of what's already around it in terms of the mix of densities and development types. We as staff, again, this is just us deliberating as a team, you know, uh, basically saw that Reeds Lake Road is kind of like that dividing line where you transition to something lower intensity as you go north. So just to clarify, you know, uh, that the plant, the comp plan is, is really a high level document that certainly gives an overview, but we also take, take into consideration um, existing land use patterns and zoning in the area. Thanks. Okay, well, I, I just want to make sure, uh, Mr. Bailey, if, if, if I'm looking at a report that seems to be throwing up some red flags that I'm at least paying attention to them, uh, because as, as this council knows and understands uh, transportation and our, uh, our infrastructure network is such a critical piece uh, in, that we hear about every day in the city. And, and if somebody's uh, trying to wave a red flag in front of me to say, hey, pay attention, I certainly want to pay attention. And I want the council to pay attention as well uh, to potential problems that we could be created creating by trying to shoehorn a development into an area that uh, perhaps is not best suited for it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that's only uh, the, all the questions I have, at least at this time. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you, sir. I don't see any other hands. I do have one question for Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey, uh, given what we've heard about uh, like Westview, for example, at what point does, at the permitting level, does CDOT require or trigger a complete road widening, reworking? And what, what, what is it that you need at that point? And what triggers that? Well, you know, the way that, the way that we grow the city councilman, most of the development that gets, most of the infrastructure that gets built, gets built by developers. Um, you, you are as familiar with the capital budget process as I am. So there are times when we focus our public money on, um, on road infrastructure, um, new connections. Um, most of what we do is maintenance, frankly. Um, so to answer your question, the best way to accommodate infrastructure that we have right now is to make sure that developers accommodate the infrastructure that they that they need. So um, connectivity is crucial because as, as I noted earlier, um, not today, but prior to that, the, the, the multifamily apartment segment four would very likely require traffic would result in traffic that would go right outside the development to Westview and would go right again on a, a narrow road. We would not be inclined to require a developer to widen Westview Road if it's around the corner, but we could require them to widen the road that abuts their property. And that's the best we can do at this point, shy of a capital project that would go in to try to improve the infrastructure. But I, I again, believe that the best way to accommodate growth is to create a, a more intense transportation grid, not necessarily widening widen roads through neighborhoods. So it's that is that is why we lean on the comprehensive plan and the area plans very heavily when we when we analyze the development and whether we think the infrastructure that's there is adequate or not. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. I don't see any other hands this afternoon on this item. So John, we're just gonna touch real quick because uh, we've got our six o'clock coming up. Uh, the steep slope vegetation ordinance is uh, in, in the works. Uh, Phil and I have been talking about where to park it. And I think that's uh, one of the things that we're figuring out. So Phil, would you, do you feel comfortable with uh, us probably setting a time frame by the end of the week Friday to to get this out to council to start looking at 
uh, once we figure out, you and I, I think we decided to park it in 38.9, um, which makes sense. And then uh, we have some graphics that are part of the ordinance that we're trying to figure out how we, we do that because we normally don't have pictures that go into an ordinance. So we're, we're working through that as well. So you wanna pick the ball up and run with it from there? Sure, uh, John, we're talking about specific provisions regarding landscaping and sleep slopes and where that would work the best. Uh, 38.9 is the landscaping provisions in the zoning ordinance here that we would need to look at. And uh, we're, we're talking about trying to at least talk about specific uh, limits on the amounts of development, depending on the size of the structures that might be involved in the amount of land use that is in, in that area. Some of that sounds very similar to some of the stormwater requirements that we have as well. We thought that this would be a good location to at least be able to add it here in, in this section for control on planning. So just know procedurally, we need to go through planning commission. Yes. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're aware, aware of that. Okay, that's really all I have. And unless anybody else has any questions, uh, that's where we are at today. And I do appreciate Phil uh, working with me on it. There's a lot going on right now with uh, campaigns and, 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 and at the council level. So uh, we'll try and get this finalized and out to everybody uh, by Friday. So that's where we're at. Um, if anybody else has any comments, questions, or concerns at this point, if not, Mr. Chairman, I will adjourn us until six o'clock. Very well. I don't see any other hands, sir. Very good. We are adjourned.